Brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
to the art of songwriting. Let me see how many tips I've got here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I've got 12 tips for you. 12 tips. So the first one is listen to good songwriters. Listen to good songwriters. It's simple enough. Now, who you listen to and who you define that are good may be relative. But from my perspective, I don't even have enough time on this video to give you a list of the songwriters that I listen to and that I'm inspired by. But I will give you a handful. First of all, John Lennon, Paul McCartney. Eagles, Glenn Frey from the Eagles. Budja Banton, yes, Budja Banton. Of course, Barry Salmon. Guy Chambers, who, if you don't know who Guy Chambers is, Guy Chambers is the writing, writing, is the writing partner of Robbie Williams. And the thing I like about Gary, Gary and Robbie's writing is that they write with a sense of irony. There's a, there's a common thread of irony in their songs that I absolutely love, you know? And I've taken some tips from their songwriting. Also, Diane Warren. If you don't know who Diane Warren is, Diane Warren is, is one of the top, 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 top songwriters. She don't just write for artists. She writes for movies and stuff. Do you know what I mean? That's how big she is. And when you see her, she's just a, I wouldn't say diminutive Caucasian woman. It's like, she's a nondescript Caucasian woman that's very mellow. But she applies herself to songwriting in a way that when you see, when you hear it on the big screen, when you hear it, you know, through Celine Dion or whoever she writes for, Aerosmith, you know, it's, it's the bigness, the scope of the song is, is evident in her songwriting. Um, Babyface. Babyface writes some good tunes. He writes some good songs. Um... Lamont Dozier, um, Ashford and Simpson, Motown, and also the late, great Amy Winehouse. Yes, she's late and she's great. You know what I mean? Didn't misquote late and great. Amy Winehouse. <sighs> Boy, I'd... I need another video just to talk about that woman alone, you know? seriously seriously missed talented troubled individual just listen to good songwriters there's so many there's so many other songwriters okay and with that you can get an idea of where your head needs to basically be another thing as well that i must add with that is don't be quick to cover certain tunes, you know? Don't be quick to cover certain tunes because they are good, well-written songs. I.e., for example, the recent spate of tunes that a lot of people have covered in terms of Ed Sheeran songs and Adele songs. It's like they've not given those songs even a chance to breathe. And, you know, some reggae artists have just basically jumped on those, on those tunes and you wonder why Ed Sheeran and Adele's making, or at least are worth 150 million pounds each. Because we're jumping on their songs. You know, I don't see Ed Sheeran covering a Pete Huntingale song. You know what I mean? I don't see Adele covering a Sandra Cross song. Do you? Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, so it came from them. You know, it, it, it emitted from them. Do you know what I'm saying? Irrespective. A good song is a good song is a good song. But we have to learn to write our songs so that other artists can see the songs that we basically write and they're inspired. Give you a case in point. Main Squeeze. I wrote Main Squeeze in 15 minutes and I literally had to beg Mr. Palmer at Jetstar if I can voice the tune. It wasn't a case I just heard, I heard the rhythm track Went and voiced it. Nope. I heard the rhythm track from Donna Marie's album. And um, her album was called Now Is The Time. I have her to thank for me 
having a hit with Main Squeeze. Because if I didn't hear, if I didn't take that album home with me from Jetstar's warehouse and heard Now Is The Time and realised that she recorded on the Columbus rhythm, I would not have known and I would not have had that hit. Do you know what I mean? But the Columbus rhythm was on that. I heard the track. I phoned up Rough Cut, asked Rough Cut, can I voice on, on the track? They basically said, you've got to talk to Mr. Palmer. I'm signed to the record company. Why do I have to basically talk to Mr. Palmer? I'm signed to the record company. But anyway, went down to Jetstar and they still told me I had to go and see Mr. Palmer. Went to see Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer basically told me, well, uh, Mr. Brown, we have, we have commissioned an artist to, to, um, to voice the tune and we're putting out a video and um, this and that. And I just said to Mr. Palmer, I said, look, no disrespect, right? I don't know who this artist is, right? But I'll voice the tune. If you don't like the tune, rub off my voice off of the tune. Because I'm just one of these people that if I've got a song, I'm writing it and I want to put it out. I don't have people coming on my studio to sing songs and, and, and I shelve the artist. I don't write songs to be shelved by no producer. You get what I'm saying? Because I'm a vessel to... to to express what I'm expressing at that time I'm expressing. See? So that's my inner being in terms of songwriting. So he agreed and the artist in question was, um, was Freddie McGregor. The song in question was a song called Searching. Um, some DJs must know the song. Um, but I decided to record Main Squeeze on the track. Main Squeeze became a hit, an international hit. And as a result, Alicia Keys, who heard the song and had a tune called You Don't Know My Name, decided to actually do a remix of the song on the rhythm. So although she's not covering my song, She's basically putting a remix of one of her songs on a rhythm that I helped done pop up the place without the help of Freddie McGregor. No disrespect. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm talking about. You writing from your own headspace, from your own being and letting that flow. Yeah, right. And having um, the producers or the record label work alongside you and put it out there. Right. So. Don't be quick to cover artists who just put tunes out the other day. When I cover tunes, it's literally tunes that are at least 10 years old. Do you know what I mean? Um, I've had people compliment me in, in, in saying, yeah, that's a good tune you wrote. And I had to say to them, no, I didn't, I didn't write that song. And I send them the original of the tune. And then I get back, wow, I didn't realise such and such sang that song. I like your version better. And that's fine, you know, but I'm not trying to be in competition with the person that originally wrote the song. That's foolishness. But I get the sentiment of where the people are coming from in relation to comparing my version with the original version. But anyway, I digress. So that was tip one and one A, okay? Now, tip number two. Let the music or the rhythm put the subject in the song. Now, by that I mean, when you hear the rhythm that you're going to basically voice on, because now we're living in a rhythm-based industry, dare I call it that? We're living in a rhythm-based industry. And the reason why rhythms have been so prevalent is just because of cost-effectiveness. It's cheaper. It's cheaper to have a setter man or a producer build one tune and have 20 million artists voice on that one tune, right? In a way, it's, it's not a bad thing. In a way, it can be a daunting thing because the, the onus is on you to have a song on that rhythm with 20 million other people, right? And have that song kind of poke his head above the precipice, if you like. 
you know, and that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you have artists like Sanchez or Capleton or Luciano or Beris or Taras Riley or Beanie Man on them rhythms. You get what I'm saying? Just, just to know that they are on the rhythms and you haven't even heard the rhythms can be daunting, right? Give you another tune. For example, Taras Riley, she's royal, right? Dean Fraser asked me to voice that tune. I politely declined. He replied, I'm not asking you. <laughs> because he recognized my talent, you know. Bless his heart, man. Canon. He, he, he recognized my talent. And that's why he was saying, yo, I'm not asking you. Vice the tune. And he wasn't saying it out of disrespect. He was just basically just slapping sense into me by saying, look, come on, man. Come on, man. You know what I mean? You're not in no competition with Taras. Taras is in no competition with you. That's, that's what I was kind of getting with that. And to begin with, I wasn't. My, my thought process was, okay, Taras put out a tune called She's Rile. The tune done mash up the players worldwide. I don't want to jump on that. You know what I mean? I'm already established, but I didn't want to jump on that and ride his coattails, as it were. But at the end of the day, it's all about music. 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 And the music finding its rightful people taking its rightful course, as Bob says. You know, so listening to a rhythm right um and letting it put the subject in the song by that i mean when you hear the rhythm and you allow your thought process to connect with the rhythm and let it paint a scenario is like um it's like image association like how the, the psychiatrist puts up puts up an image and they would say okay what does that remind you of instantly and then you would say good songs or what have you you know what i mean you say what what is associated now with rhythms it's the same thing and that's what i allow myself to do i don't listen to what other artists has got on the same rhythm I just listen to the rhythm as it is, as blank a canvas as I can possibly make the rhythm to be, and I put my feelings across. Even if there's predominantly roots artists on the track, right? If I feel a love song within the track, I'm going with that. I'm not gonna sing a roots track because Cableton and Sizzler and Bushman and whoever has voiced Roots song on it. Just because they've done it, that doesn't mean to say I must do it as well. You know what I mean? So that's how I allow my, um, my creativity, um, my association with the rhythm, my musical association with the rhythm. That's how I let it manifest. And, um, and just write to that. Just write, write to that. Um, Okay, uh, number three, number three, which I am a stickler for. Uh, don't cliche, don't put cliched stock phrases, stock lyrics in a song, okay? Right, in terms of stock lyrics, Climb the highest mountain, I'll swim the deepest sea. Blah, de blah, 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 blah. Okay? That is like, that is like nails down a blackboard to me when I hear those lyrics because it tells me that the person's being lazy, absolutely lazy. They're not even using a thought process. Do you know what I mean? You know? You can basically say, Okay, even if you wanted to say, I'll climb the highest mountain, put a different spin on it. Put a different spin on it. Like to say, okay, for you, my love, even me perched on the top of Mount Everest with no oxygen, I would remain here for your undying love and affection. 
right? That sounds better. That sounds dramatic. That's, you can paint a picture, but I can't, I can't paint a picture of somebody climbing the highest mountain because they're not going to do it. It's like, come on now, come on. It's like, if I was to climb the highest mountain and if I was to reach the summit of the mountain, I will stay there with a lack of oxygen just to show my undying love to you. Now, when you utter them lyrics to a woman, it's like, yeah, really? <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I don't want to suggest that women are stupid, please. No. But, um, <laughs> but put a spin on a cliche if you have to use a cliche at all, right? Another cliche that is like nails down a blackboard for me is a phrase. And I'm going to let you people know this phrase. I cannot stand this phrase. If I hear this phrase on any songs, it's like, no, no, please. And I'm going to sing the phrase to you right now. When I hear people sing this phrase, oh, <laughs> you want to hear it again? When I hear that phrase, I just want to, I just want to scream. I just want to scream because it's a typical lover's rock phrase that I cannot stand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not putting down no artist. Believe me when I say that. I'm not putting down no artist. It's just the fact that those notes in that order don't sit well with me. You know what I mean? It's just one of those lovers rock phrases that, you know, just find a, find different phrases, find different phrases within melodies, I should say. Different melodies within the chords that you're basically singing, you know, because the chords are just not made of just three notes. There's eighths and there's fifths as well. Do you know what I'm saying? So, or sevenths that you can basically use within the chord to make the chord even bigger. Do you know what I'm saying? But when you when you sing, oh, you're basically singing double the notes that makes up the chord that you're singing on top of. So to me, it don't it just doesn't sound good. I don't like that phrase. Don't like it. If I could ban it, I'll ban it. <laughs> okay, right. Tip number four, and this tip comes from Paul Simon, of all people. And he basically states, don't say in two lines what you can say in one. Because what you're going to find is that if you start making a point in two lines, if you're making a statement in two lines, you're more or less drawing out what you're saying. It's like when you have a conversation with somebody and they said, well, I just want to say before I start that um, I went down the shop the other day and I went to Primark and I was looking around and I saw this nice, nice shirt and, you know, I didn't know whether to buy it or not. And it's like you're thinking, get to the point. <laughs> Where you want to chat to me for? You want to talk to me about going to Primark? <laughs> Is that the urgency for me to talk to you right now? So that's what I'm basically saying. Don't say in two lines what you can basically say in one. Get to the point in each line that you want to say, okay? Um, tip number five. Remember, song lyrics doesn't necessarily have to rhyme. Poetry is something that um, the words are basically brush strokes. They're brush strokes on a canvas for people to paint their own picture, okay? Because sometimes as a songwriter, as a vocalist, I listen to a song and it's almost like, okay, um, uh, if they say, or if I was to say, no, sorry. If they were to say, my name is John Brown, Automatically, my head is kind of like processing and thinking, okay, what rounds with brown, town, down, frown, crown. Do you know what I mean? And it's like a lottery as to which one of those words is he going to use for the second line. 
That's just my thought process. Do you know what I mean? And if he was to say, my name is John Brown or Joe Brown, and I'm six foot one, it's something you're not going to expect, isn't it? But it keeps you engaged. It's like, okay, you're six foot one. All right, so what has that got to do with anything? Let me hear some more. Do you know what I mean? You know, but if it's like, okay, my name is John Brown and I come from London town. If I hear that, it's like, okay, I got his songwriting down already. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay, let's see what, yeah, let's see what happens next. Guarantee everything's going to rhyme. It's going to rhyme and it's going to rhyme poorly. Do you know what I mean? But don't be afraid of writing songs that doesn't necessarily rhyme because poetry, there's no one size fits all to poetry where you're painting a picture with the prose, with the text that you are singing, vocalizing rather. Okay, um, number six. Here's a tip that I'm gonna give you, right? Which I used for one of my hits. And the song is Love You Damn. Um, Come on, baby, let me love you down. That song, right? And it's a good tip if you, if you want to write a more compact song within a certain time frame, okay? And I call it a mirror writing tip. So with the first line of the verse, of the first verse is... I'm in my corner and I'm watching you, watching me. Okay? And then I write according to that with the melody and the lyrics that follow. Now, in verse 2, what I do to kind of put a different spin on it is reverse it, is mirror that. So it's like, now you're in your corner and you're watching me, watching you. Get what I'm saying? So you're putting two, two points of view in two verses. And that paints a really good picture, in my opinion. And I think that's one of the reasons why the song became, became a hit for so many people. You know, it's like they identified with that. It's... it's is utilizing the scenario of both our eyes making four across a crowded room kind of thing. It actually painted that picture, for me anyway. So I know it kind of resonated with a lot of people and them enjoying the song as they did. You know, so it's a it's a more it's a more tidier way of writing. It's a more um what's the word? It's a recycled way of songwriting, but not in a disrespectful sense. Do you know what I'm saying? It just makes it, you, you, can, you just use what's there in the first verse, turn it around, turn it inside out, put a different viewpoint, put a different slant on it, but have it culminate into the message that you're singing. I just want to love you, man. I just want to love you. I just want to love you. Because I love what I see. You know what I mean? And that's basically it. Mirror writing tips. I use that a lot. I still use that tip to this day. Um, tip number seven. Be truthful, man. Be truthful. Be truthful. You know, for me, some of the, the, the most heartfelt songs comes from people who literally pour their heart out on the floor. And expose their weakness, their frailties, and their inner turmoil that goes on in their head. And they're not the only people that goes through it, but they are the few people that basically will expose that about themselves, you know, just to show that even though I'm singing, I'm going through pain, I'm going through life's pains and trials and turmoil you know I, I go through these things as well and that's why you know you you have people like Adele she writes songs she writes breakup songs you know what I mean because she went through what she basically went through right but I still have to go 
back to Amy Winehouse. I have to go back to Amy Winehouse for the simple reason that even with a bottle of brandy dosed up on crack on stage, in some instances, she sound, she sound better than some vocalists that are sober. And I'm not disrespecting anybody, but I, I can see and feel her pain. It's like Billie Holiday. Do you know what I'm saying? Great jazz singer. Turmoil, pain, heartbreak. Do you know what I'm saying? You know, people, some people tend to forget that, you know? But it's the truth. It's the truth. And once you're truthful in your music, you know, you, you, can't, you can't go wrong. I got a line in um, in a song that I done called blah blah blah, and I was telling the truth. I was saying, you know, some people talk about don't put your trust in vanity, but them dye them locks and they dye their beard. Why are you telling me don't put your trust in vanity when you dye your locks and you dye your beard black? You know what I'm saying? It makes no sense <laughs> to me. Be truthful. Be truthful. Be truthful. Just be truthful, you know? Or at least say, well, okay, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, tip number eight is write songs that people can sing to. That is really important because if you, you know, if you're thinking about having a song that's going to be appreciated loved by the masses that listen to it, they're going to have to be able to sing along with it, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like, you know, we can, there's, there's songs that I've sung to from I was a child, right? That I had the lyrics wrong, but I still kind of felt what the song was about, you know? One song, for example, um, and it's a wild card, but I'm going to give you this song. It's Bujo Banton's Untold Stories. While I'm living, while I'm living to the Father, I will pray. Only him know all we get through every day. Without the hike in the price of my leg, we have to pay. While our leaders play. Now, that song, that song resonates with me so well, simply because of the fact that Budgers Till Shiloh's album made me change my direction in, in terms of songwriting. But that song in particular is a song that I see young kids singing that song. I've seen grown ass people singing that song and they're singing that song word for word for word for word. It was one of those songs that literally woke me out of my sleep. Them time I used to watch Caribbean Rhythms on cable. And I fell asleep and I remembered waking up. I just heard the song. While I'm living, thanks I'll be giving. And it literally woke me up out of my sleep. And I watched that video and that changed my life. And by the tip, I'm saying a song like that, I can never forget that song. I, I can always sing along to that song. Always sing along to that song. What you don't want to do as a, a vocalist and as a songwriter, I mean, it's kind of like prevalent with, with Sing Jays, who I consider Sing Jays. They have a style, which is good, right? Yeah, and you can put like 20,000 words in one verse, but if I can't sing along with that, I'm not, I'm not even gonna basically try and over what you're saying to me. It's like, yeah. But yeah. I'm not trying to pick up on that. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's he saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you keep the song simple, and write in a way that you would want people to hear it and over is it and sing it back to you, right? And the biggest example I can bring 
to you at this point was a situation I saw for myself. And it was when me and my band, um, Sweet Distortion, supported Gregory Isaacs at the Brixton Academy, that concert. Yes, we supported Gregory Isaacs at that show when he was at the Brixton Academy. And I remember when he said, I heard you said to me, you wanna be my number one. That was easy money for Gregory to make. All he had to do was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was easy money. That was easy money. He was literally just standing up on the stage and the audience was singing the song for him. That's a mark of a good song, a well-written song. You don't have to be like Daddy Freddy on a vocal. You get what I'm saying? Daddy Freddy's Daddy Freddy doing what he does on the genre of songs that he's basically doing. And yeah, I can appreciate, I can appreciate love that because it's a dance art thing and it's an energy thing. You get what I'm saying? It's like, it's not about 60 BPMs or 70 BPMs. It's all about 120 plus BPMs. You get what I'm saying? It's the energy. That's fine. I and mean, I disrespect nobody. But when you're writing songs, when you're writing songs, there's a difference between writing a well-crafted song with as few lyrics as possible and writing a song that's got a style and you've got 20 million words in one verse. Do you know what I mean? You know, that's just me. I know people can, be, can, people can differ in relation to that. Um, but write songs with a view for your listeners to be able to sing along with your songs. That's what I'm saying. Okay, tip number nine. Whether it is a melody, whether it is a chorus, whether it is lyrics, have one to begin with. I know that is a no shit Sherlock alert, but what I mean by that tip is not going to be a one size fits all thing when you have ideas to write a song. For example, sometimes you might have the lyrics first, but you don't have a melody. Sometimes you might have a melody and you don't have the lyrics or the chorus, right? But what I'm saying is, is that let, let your will submit to whatever comes first and work with that, okay? And then everything is a building block for you to build on top of. And the rudiments of your vocals, um, your vocal arrangements are basically the seasoning to put another pot and get the spice and get the flavour, you know what I mean? So... It's not a regimented thing where you must have the melody first, you must have the chorus first, you must have the lyrics first. Everybody writes songs different. So just let it flow, let the vibes flow and just have each thing that you have first of all and work on that and have that as a building block or a foundation for the rest of your song that is going to be written. It's simple, but it needs to be said. Okay. Uh, number 10, your phone is your co-writer. Now, my bandmates, they're already going to basically be saying on this video, what do you mean, Libra? Libra don't have room to talk about phone and phone. He's been using this crappy phone. Yes, this crappy phone for years. <laughs> And don't even upgrade itself. <laughs> I'll tell you why I, I used that phone for a long time. One reason, battery life. The battery used to last a week, a week between charges. And I'm one of these people, it's like, you know, when, when the whole iPhone thing came out, yeah, I was, I was on the hype train. I think I bought the iPhone 3, 3S or something like that. You know what I mean? It was like I took out a mortgage to buy that phone. But then when I basically started using it, it's like it wasn't natural for me to use it in the way that other people are using it now. And today I just see smartphones as a weapon of rudeness sometimes. Because you see people that are just down in their phone and donging, donging at their phone, looking in their phone, looking in their phone before they even engage in eye contact with you. That's why it's, in certain regards, my bona fire upon the phone, you know what I mean? But, but from a creative standpoint, my phone is my co-writer. 
Don't get me wrong. I love pen and paper. I love the pen and paper, okay? But when you're on the go, when you have a quick idea and you don't have no pen and paper, voice recorder, voice recorder and memo. Those are the two apps that are of use to me at that particular time, right? Now, who am I as an old fart to be giving young people that tip when they've been using that tip for a long time? So I'm just talking to the old farts among us with that tip, okay? <laughs> uh, right, okay. Tip number 11. When you write songs, don't have a hit song in mind. By that I mean, don't write the song thinking that, yeah man, it's your body, body, bad, yeah man, it's your tough plus tax. Yeah, ray, 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 yeah man, I hit you on this. Ray, ray, blah, 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 blah. Don't have that in your mind. And I say that for many different reasons. And some of the reasons are political. Okay, how do I, I mean, I got, as one of my friends, I mean, I got sugar coated, right? But this business that we're in, the music business that we're in, right, are mixed. We have people that basically have an holistic approach to how songs are created, how songs are made, how songs are produced, how songs are pre presented, how songs are promoted. And I'm talking, I'm talking singers, vocalists, DJs, promoters. I'm going across the board. But out of those groups of people, there's a small percentage of them people who I consider to be cockroaches them, right? Who just basically feed off of what they want, feed off of, right? And hustlers who they have no interest, no interest whatsoever in promoting an artist. They just want to hustle off the artist, right? And earn for them money, right? So even if you write a song, right? If you write a song and by your standards and by the people around you standards is a top quality, well-written, well-crafted song that people are going to get. Even if, you, even if you have that in mind, some DJs won't play your songs because you might not have given them a special or a dub play or they just don't like you or other reasons or you're not paying them no money to play no tunes. And I'm talking from a global aspect. OK, when you write songs, right, this is very important. When you write songs, write songs with a view for the song to stand up. Right. When you write a song that stands up through time, through the test of time, that is the biggest accolade you can get. Long after the DJ, them pack up them bucks and go them yard. Right. Your song will be still serving its purpose. I'm gonna tell you something. Main Squeeze, my song Main Squeeze has been my biggest earner in terms of royalties. I get the most royalties for that song above any other, any other song. Main Squeeze still earns me the most royalties. Um, I can't even get into the album, which album has sold more and what have you. But I'm talking about the song Main Squeeze that's given me the most royalties. And even now, it's still getting played now. Long after its release, it's still getting played because it's a, it's a well-crafted song. Well-crafted. People can sing along to the song, even though some people get the lyrics, Fresh wallpaper tonight. <laughs> they get that wrong. It's press wallpaper tonight. <laughs> Even though they get the lyrics wrong, which 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 I which, which which was a point I was harking back to before. They get the overall sense of what the song is about. But anyway, um, don't have a hit song in mind because there's so many variables and there's so many permutations in this business where bad mind is just going to be active. You know, they're just going to be active. People are not going to basically support you because they don't like you or they're jealous of you and what have you. But when you write a song, right, and the power of the internet brings it to the people, 
it's taking its rightful course and it's finding its rightful people. And if you write a song in a rightful, upful way, of course it's going to connect. Do you know what I'm saying? If people write, you know, um, arms ass tunes and tunes of violence and hatred, I ain't listening to that. I'm not listening to that. So it's not going to find me. You get what I'm saying? You know? And even if a DJ don't, don't want to play your tunes, he's not the only DJ in the world. He's not the only DJ in the world. You know what I mean? You can host your own sites and play your own tunes and people will find you if people have any regard for you and what you do. Okay? Right. And the last tip of all, remember, songwriting is a craft. You will get better. Okay? Now, with any craft, you can only improve in time. If you draw, if you're an artist, if you're drawing for the first time, you know, I could say, well, yeah, I'm an artist and I'm going to try and draw something. I'm going to draw a face. That's what I've got. That's a face. That's a face to me. With a smile where... The right side of his mouth meets up with his eye. So he has, a, he has a facial disfigurement condition. But he's a face. It can be agreed that he's a face. Okay? Now, you're going to want to get better than that. So it's a matter of time where, oh, faces has noses. There you go. I'm putting a nose on that. Okay? Turn it into that, etc., etc., etc. So with songwriting, um, you'll write your songs in a in a in a basic way, um, basic nondescript way, I guess. And then with time, utilizing all the tips that I've given to you today, you will get better. You know, it's not an instant thing, you know. But life, life is a perpetual constant existence where you go through things you see things right you see things and as a result you write about those things another song for example black bags right black bags people thought was about me but it wasn't about me i was literally in a in a studio and i heard um an associate basically tell the story of him being with his girlfriend, her having a child for him, or so he thought, and realised that the child wasn't his. And he was really, really upset about that. And I decided to write Black Bags. I decided to write Black Bags to put a spin on that situation. I suppose it had a bit of comedic value in that way because... The, the, the very item of the black bag people can immediately identify with, okay? So it kind of brought a comedic thing, but the basis of that song came from a very serious, heartbroken place. Do you know what I mean? So um, that's where black bags came from. So with songs... You know, with experiences, with life's experiences, not only your own, but other people's experiences, you know, you can tap into those things and basically write according to how you see the situation. And with any, any luck, people can empathise on hearing the song and relate to other people. You know, it's, 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 it's an expression. Songwriting is an expression. So when I hear people write songs in a slapdash nursery rhyme cartoon theme tune fashion it just kind of kind of grates me do you know what i'm saying it just goes against my whole principle of what songwriting is but it's a thing that people can learn and it's a thing that people can really be exceptional at if you put the time in you know what i mean because disposable songs are just what they are disposable songs hit songs can be hits for a certain amount of time but good songs good songs will always stand the test of time you don't have to have a number one 
hit tune for the tune to carry. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, it is 50 minutes. I've given you a 50 minute video. <laughs> so it's with that, I'm gonna bid you guys adieu for now. I hope you full enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching the video and thank you for the amount of props I've been getting for these vlogs. I'm glad you find them informative, educating, edifying, entertaining. I'm glad that you're, you're taking what you're taking from this because, you know, it's another form of creativity and I'm just giving you what I have in me because that's what music done to me. You know, music gave me what it gave me and it filled me with what it filled me with. And music has been the one thing that has kept my head above water through a whole heap of stuff that's gone on in my life. Do you know what I'm saying? Good times and sad times. And even throughout sad times as well, you know, it enabled me to write a song like Absent Friends. Sorry, it enabled me to write a song like Absent Friends yesterday that made me feel what I felt. It made me grieve. I mean, grieve properly in that time frame last night. So, you know, I'm not just writing to order. You know, I'm, I, I do feel what I write. I, I feel what I write when, when I've finished and I've actually heard the song. Writing the song, doing, it, doing the mechanics of it, that's fine. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm in work mode. But then when I actually sit down and listen to the finished product, as it were, and let that sink into me, and I felt how I felt as a result, I know, I, I know I'm doing what I'm doing right. So anyway, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for taking in the video. And um, as always, you don't know the coup. Abstain from foolishness wherever possible. And until I catch you on the next video, people, stay blessed. Magan. <laughs>